And if you see food in the stomach after 12 hours, this is diagnostic as well for hypomotility disorders. General anesthesia mandatory, mandatory, this is not negotiable. The sedation depends on what you know better and what your anesthesiologist knows better. Some people use medication that can loosen the pyloric region. I do not want that because I do not want medication to alter um, the image that I have uh, about the motility of the, and the contractility of the stomach. Patient positioning, as you see, always on left lateral recumbency, always. Uh, because this place is the gastric uh, antrum uh, uppermost and the pyloris is more easily visible, except for the case that you want to uh, place a uh, percutane, a peg tube uh, in order to, um, to feed the animal. And this is done in light lateral recumbency. And sometimes we have foreign bodies, heavy foreign bodies, um, that we want to move a bit. So we put the, the animal in left lateral recumbency. We can rotate the animal, the patient in right lat uh, lateral recumbency as well in order to, um, to move the, the, the foreign body. Hello from Romania. Hello from Saudi Arabia. I'm going to be Ahmed in Saudi Arabia in a, in a few months. Um, adrenaline before the biopsy. No way. No way. Don't be so scared. No, no, never. So now let's go to real cases and see how a normal esophagus is and also check how, what the pathology, a lot of pathological uh, inputs in the uh, esophageal area. So esophagus should be gray pink, flaccid. The lumen may contain uh, some, a bit here so that I can see the lesions. So uh, the lumen may contain some fluid, some foam. So don't be scared if you see a bit of a, of, uh, some foam like this one or saliva, this is absolutely normal. So if you want the lumen to be open and to be inflated with more air, you hold, you tell your nurse to hold the cervical region of the animal. Your animal is, uh, your patient is already intubated. Okay. And you may see, I'm going to put this here again so that you can see, this is the pharyngeal uh, sphincter here. So we're on the third, first third of the esophagus. Okay. You can easily detect sometimes the identification uh, of the trachea due to the uh, ET tube that you have, uh, that you have put. Here it's not that much inflated in order to see the identification. And when you reach the base of the heart, you will, oh, here is the uh, identification of uh, the trachea. And when you reach the base of the heart, you will see the heart beating. So you know where you are located. And we proceed to the lower esophageal sphincter here. Okay. The esophagus is very tough to biopsy, very, very tough to biopsy. I have challenged a lot of human gastroenterologists to do that, and they haven't achieved because they were, you know, just smoking me. You can't take bites from the esophagus, and I said, you try it. And if you try it, I give you, you know, free tickets to Dubai, I don't know what, whatever you, you want, but nobody succeeded. It's very, very difficult. I've tried, and I'm, I'm trying to um, actually take biopsies from the esophagus because I'm certain that there is pathology in, this, in the esophagus that we uh, leave it undiagnosed. Um, for example, in humans, in children, eosinophilic esophagitis is a huge issue. So could be in dogs and cats, but we don't know it because we don't biopsy the esophagus. So the pulsation of the wall mark uh, the, uh, the base of the heart that you are adjusted to the, uh, to the great vessels and the heart. Uh, you can sometimes see the wave of paracelsis. And in dogs, the sudden cause of that, this is a dog. Uh, the one that I've showed you here is a dog. Uh, the sudden causal vessels are not visible, as you may see, and I'm going to show you a cat, you will see the difference. 
except if the patient is a puppy. In some Jojo and uh, Sharpe breeds, you can find uh, pigmented patches uh, just as in their cat, and this is not pathological, okay? And in the cat, we have submucosal vessels that are visible, and also crystal esophagus, we have uh, circular folds. I'm going to show you. This is a normal esophagus as well, but I wanted to show it to you because it has these areas of dots. And this is a very, very frequent, this is not pathological, okay? Uh, this is a very frequent um, finding in uh, senior patients, in geriatric patients. This is an esophag esophagus of a dog as well. So you see these pigmented areas here. Let me see the question. <laughs> Hi from Bosnia as well. Okay, so don't take it as uh, a pathological sign when you see that because a lot of people get scared. Okay, and this is the lower esophageal sphincter. And blood comes out of the stomach because I just have biopsied the stomach. Okay, so don't be afraid. This is not esophagitis or something that has to do with the uh, esophagus. This is blood coming out of the biopsies from the stomach that I have just taken because it's better to inspect the esophagus while we're, you're getting out. And I tried for me to biopsy the esophagus as well. I don't know if I succeeded in this case. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, but I always try it. Okay, and this is the esophagus of a cat. You see the vessels that are really, really prominent here in cats. You see how easily detectable they are in cats. In dogs, it's not the same thing. Can you see? These are the vessels of the esophagus, and these are the circular rings in the third distal part of the esophagus, just prior to the proximal to the lower esophageal sphincter. Okay, so in cats, if you see those rings, even if you don't know what this animal is, we don't write anywhere here what this animal is. This is a cat, okay? So let's go to talk a bit about esophagitis. And in esophagitis, of course, we have erythema, we have irregularity, we have a lot of erosions, and we have this entity that it's called reflex esophagitis, when uh, we have a retrograde movement from the stomach into the esophagus. There are two kinds of reflex diseases in the gastrointestinal tract. The uh, GERD, the gastroesophageal uh, reflex disease and the duodenogastric reflex disease, these two reflex uh, diseases. Both of them cause the first one esophagitis, the other one gastritis. So in terms of the uh, reflex esophagitis, let's see where the lesions are. Most of the lesions, I'm going to show you a very severe case here, and you can see that it, in circumferential, you see that this mucosa here is normal and all the lesions are located just proximal to the lower supergeal sphincter and the, less of this, uh, the rest of the esophagus is normal. This is, raises a high suspicion of gastrointestinal uh, reflex esophageal uh, disease. Okay, and let's see that one. There is a point going from the esophagus to the stomach, which is called Z line. This is the Z line here. And some people misinterpret it for esophagitis. This is not esophagitis. This is the gastric epithelium, and this is the esophageal epithelium. And the transition between gastric uh, and uh, between from esophageal to gastric epithelium gives, gives this uh, image here. Okay, so this is a dog because we cannot see the vessels. Uh, this is the identification of the trachea. Let me show you again how the, this is the uh, on the roof of the esophagus in hour 12. Okay, you see the identification of the trachea. 
And then you go into the gastroesophageal sphincter. Is this esophagitis here? Is this esophagitis? No, this is the Z line. This is the, the, the Z line. So don't misinterpret that. Okay. The esophagus is very much normal. Of course, the um, esophageal sphincter was open, and I don't like that because I want it to be closed. And you see that retrograding, that there is a lot of fluid retrograding from the, uh, from the stomach into the lumen of the esophagus, but, uh, and it's, it stays wide open. You see, reflex disease. But it doesn't have any esophagitis yet. Will this dog proceed into having esophagitis? Highly, highly probable. Highly probable. Unless it is out of the anesthetic episode. And this is not happening constantly. I don't know what kind of pre-medication uh, we used in this specific case. Maybe it's because of the anesthetic agents. Okay. And you will see here, wow. This was a huge reflex from the stomach into the esophagus. This is how esophagitis, um, GERD disease is produced, okay? Let's go and see. Okay, there are a lot of um, classification uh, protocols for esophagitis. I mostly use either the Los Angeles one. This is extra polarization again from the human medicine. I mostly use the Savory Miller uh, classification of esophagitis and I show you here all the stages. For example, in stage one, we have one or several uh, just small erosions in uh, one because of fold. Then in grade two, we have several erosions that they are not circumferential, as in stage three. In uh, grade four, we have uh, strictures, ulcers. And in grade five, we have Barrett's disease, which is very common in humans, and it's precancerous. Um, it's gastric metaplasia in the esophagus. Uh, in the esophagus. Do we have Barrett's disease in uh, canine and feline patients? We thought that we didn't, but I will show you that we might have. Okay, let's see, now that we were talking about the um, gastrointestinal disease, the gastrointestinal, uh, the, sorry, the, uh, the GERD disease, the uh, reflex, the gastroesophageal reflex disease, let's have a look at a dog's um, Esophagus, and you're going to say now, wow, the seven causal vessels um, might be, you know, a bit more prominent. Yes, because this dog has esophagitis. Okay, not in normal esophagus. This is the identification, the, the identification of the uh, trachea. And here, if somebody was not that cautious, he he would have missed the radians of esophagitis, which are here. And thankfully, Alha has the. HPE enhancement, and you will see now that it's on, you've, you've seen when it was off, now that it's on, they're more visible. Can you see these radius of uh, blood and of uh, inflammation? So this dog has an esophagitis stage two that we would have missed without the hemoglobin enhancement, highly probable. Okay. You can see the radius of the esophagitis and inflammation. And let's go here. This is an amazing case of a cat. This is in the pharyngeal uh, part of the esophagus, just right after the pharyngeal sphincter. And this is a stricture that is forming due to a doxycycline treatment. Even if you don't get anything out of this webinar, I want you to remember just one thing. Don't give cats a pill on a dry swallow because it can remain in the esophagus for a lot of hours, cause chemical uh, irritation. Um, it, is, it has been proven that doxycycline and clindamycin can cause 
esophageal strictures, but other medications as well can cause esophageal strictures in uh, a mechanical way in cats. So never give the cat's pills on a dry swallow. It has also been measured the amount of um, water that we can give them after uh, uh, the pill, which is seven ml. So if you just give the cats seven ml of water, then the pill goes down and you don't have any problem or just a small bite of food. It's very, very essential. And here we caught the ulcer because this cat was not, it was inappetent, very, very vocalizing when great appetite at first, but when apprehending the food, the cat was vocalizing and she was doing this thing that actually was suggestive of a problem in the upper esophageal uh, area. And a stricture was beginning to be forming. This is pseudomembranes. This is necrotic tissue because we took a biopsy from that. Okay. So please be cautious with cats. So now a bit about Barrett esophagus. It's not something that you will encounter in your everyday practice, but I want you to know that. And I want you to have heard it even in one webinar that um, there, it has been proven that we can have gastric metaplasia in cats. Uh, it was this cat, uh, this was um, a paper from Dr. Ravis and his, uh, his cooperatives. Uh, it was a cat at 11 years old, hyperthyroid with chronic gastroesophageal uh, reflux disease. And also another Persian cat, I do not know if, uh, why both of these, uh, and it has been more uh, shown in Persian cats as well, with a lymphoma and chronic, the common thing is that the, the, both of the cats had uh, chronic uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Okay, so when we biopsied this tissue here, it was gastric metaplasia. It was not neoplastic tissue, but it was gastric tissue in the esophagus. And this is what Barrett's disease is. Okay, in the case uh, of a cat, Shown in this cat, which you could depict by uh, default. Uh, what we actually, yes, you could put a back tube or more easily uh, a nasogastric tube as a start. Uh, peg tubes, we, we tend to use them when we have, you know, a problem that needs longer standing solution. For example, if we have a, a chemo patient and they're vomiting and they cannot eat, or if we have a cancer patient, a patient that has tumors in the esophagus or elsewhere, and we tend to use the, the peg tube for eight months, for six months, we can just leave it uh, for, for a longer period of time. Uh, for the ulcer to be healed in the esophagus, you will be amazed, and I will show you later some cases, that it's, it needs three or four days. So you don't need to, to put a peg tube for three or four uh, days, okay? Uh, you can you put just an nasal, uh, nasal gastric tube, but put it correctly. And I will show you, if anyone wants, I will show you the correct way of putting a nasal gastric tube. Um, yes, I mean about the cat that had the doxy related. You don't put in these cats peg tubes, no. If you want, you can for your own practice, you know, just to practice and putting and placing peg tubes, but it's not needed. Nasal gastric tube for two or three days is absolutely fine. And let's go now to the esophageal strictures. Please be aware of what we talked about cats because this is a huge problem. Cats tend to have uh, strictures and we will be talking in another webinar in depth about these strictures. You have a cat. It's admitted to your clinic for a simple procedure like neutering, okay? And one week later, the owner comes and says, my cat is regurgitating and it, it does not keep, they, they would say vomiting, not regurgitating. Um, the cat will start vomiting and then regurgitating 
because the low risk of GL sphincter is very, very loose after the anesthetic episode or during the anesthetic episode. So severe esophagitis has occurred. And as a consequence, up to 16 days after your neutering, the cat can actually form a stricture. And it has been proven. There are a lot of uh, case series and a lot of research uh, for these kind of strictures in cats. And the second most, most um, popular way of having an esophageal stricture in cat is pills. Uh, we have proven, we have written uh, an article published uh, that even amoxicillin uh, and flavulanic, flavulanic acid um, can cause, if not given properly, um, esophageal stricture through a mechanical way of, uh, of the pill. And this, the capsules are even worse for cats. Okay, let's see this stricture in a cat. It is a cat because you can see the, the vessels, okay. So we see esophagitis here. And we're reaching up to a point. What do we hear that we cannot proceed? You will see a bit further. In strictures, we have a circumferential narrowing of the mucosa. We have, we can have esophagitis or, and here we are. You can see how broad the esophagus volumen was. Uh, I have to stop it here so that you can see how broad the esophagus was and how it has narrowed down. And you can measure the stricture with your forceps by opening the forceps. Not even the forceps could pass through this. Uh, through this diameter, this small, this stricture was. Okay, so most of the times when the cats are uh, submitted to our clinics, they don't have esophagitis because the fiber tissue has already been formed. They have passed the, the stage of esophagitis. So now the tissue is fibrous, it's very, very firm, um, and there's nothing to be done rather than balloon dilations up to this point, okay? So intraluminal causes of esophageal stricturing could be gastroesophageal uh, gastro reflux disease. This is why after your neutrings, always ask the owners, is the cat hypersalivating three or four days after your operation? And cats, when they don't feel, when they feel nausea, they do this extension of the neck. They just stab it because this is painful. Pain, esophagitis is a real painful situation. And they go like, they're extending the neck. If you see that, please suspect esophagitis and try to give medication that will prevent esophagitis and esophageal stricture. Otherwise they will end up with a stricture. Okay, drug juice, we talked about that. Foreign bodies, of course, and uh, neoplasia can also cause a stricturing. I'm going to show you some cases of all of those things. This is a cat here with uh, reflex esophagitis due to an anesthetic episode. And this is one week after the neutering. Will this cat have a stricture? Yes, if we have left it in its own fate, it would have had a stricture. Yes. So you see the kind of esophagitis, circumferential, stage three, because all the gastric fluid has come into the esophagus. And we got into the stomach. It actually has started to form uh, a ring. This is why I'm going back and forth with the, with the tip of the scope in order to open it. And then we will give medication in order to prevent it. Okay. And you see that the further up we go, the better the esophagus looks. Of course, this cat has vomited throughout the base of the heart. So there are lesions because the, the reflex uh, disease has been up to the base of the heart. Uh, there are lesions up to this point. Okay.
And of course, there are extralunar causes of esophageal stricturing, like a persistent right aortic arc, like here. So the esophagus is entrapped uh, at the level of the heart, and we have mega esophagus and anterior mediastinal lymphoma, everything, anything, I will show you a case, anything that can strangulize, that can actually entrap the esophagus exterior, extraluminarily. And this is how it looks. This is a three months old German Shepherd. This is how it looks. The esophagus cannot be inflated. You cannot see the lumen. And you feel that this is not the kind of stricture that you get you know, interluminarly with the fibrous tissue, but it's something from the outside pressing the uh, esophagus. And please be aware because some people miss the diagnosis of uh, persistent right aortic arc because sometimes there are reports of late onset. Uh, we had cases that were two and a half years old and one eight years old with chronic regurgitation. And they had a uh, persistent right aortic line. Uh, so don't be confused if you see uh, an adult dog and always, you know, have your medical criteria on the line first and then the books and what the textbooks uh, say. Medicine is not in the textbooks. Of course, you have to know uh, all the information, but it's you who process the information. How do we dilate? How do we make the dilation? There are a lot of uh, ways by boogies, by balloon dilation, and with the tip of the endoscope, if it's a very recent uh, stricture. I prefer the balloons. I've never used the boogies. Uh, please do not use the... I've seen... Uh, dilating strictures with a range of, uh, of things. Uh, most commonly with ET tubes, you cannot uh, control the pressure of the cuff of the ET tube. And sometimes this causes rupture of the esophagus. So um, we definitely have to use the, uh, the balloons, the proper equipment, the proper instrumentation in order to do a procedure. Maximum procedures I've done in kittens, 14 dilations in order to, in some kittens, very small kittens, 14 dilations. And um, it used to be once every week, once every 10 days in the textbooks. Now this is changing. You have to do it before the ring reforms, which is every two or three days. Um, so you put the balloon uh, in the stricture, you inflate it. It's a radial stretching, which is less traumatic than the ET tube, for example, and you can control the pressure. The balloon should be at least 10 centimeters long. My balloons are 10 centimeters long, uh, so that it covers the whole length. Always look for a second or third stricture down the esophagus uh, lumen, because sometimes you open one stricture and then you go and there's another stricture as well. Um, they can be put through the stove or sideways. I always put them sideways. You will see now how I do it. Uh, a 20 millimeters balloon is a universal balloon, which is the most useful size. Of course, I have all range of sizes from six millimeters up to uh, 35 millimeters. It depends on the size of the ankle and the stricture. And inflation with water rather than uh, giving, you can inflate air, you can inflate water, uh, but it's better to um, inflate air for the safety of your uh, balloon. Okay, let's see the esophageal stricture in cat. This is the cat that I've shown you earlier. Okay, so we reach up to a point where the esophageal lumen is has no width at all. And you either have to do it or, you know, then it's esophageal surgery, which is not good. Esophageal surgery causes more stricture, actually, um, after that. And most of the times we succeed with uh, the balloons. Okay, so we reach up to this stricture here, and this is what we did. So we put the balloon 
in the center. Even that is a bit difficult. If you do it sideways, it will go all the other ways rather than the way that you really want it. So you put it in the middle, you put all your balloon uh, throughout the length of the, of the uh, stricture. And then you start inflating once you're safely in the position, then you start inflating it. And then you leave it for around, I leave it for 30, 40 seconds sometimes, and even more. What medication should be appropriate for esophagitis? Yes, I'm going to show you all the medication. We're going to talk about the medication. Uh, do we need additional machines for balloon inflation? No, we just inflate it with a syringe. It's not a big deal of, of, of an air. Yes, you inflate it. You pre-inflate it outside the patient so that you feel that it's distended to its fullest. Okay, and then you know how much air you need to put in. You deflate it, you put it in the patient, and then you inflate the air, the amount of the air that you have inflated outside the patient. About, uh, sure, about the esophagitis, we will talk a bit uh, later. Okay, let's see the result of our dilation. Let's see what we did. Now what I'm doing is that, can you see how much tearing of a tissue here? I have, this was the very, very small, tiny hole. And we have now enlarged the diameter. We have augmented the diameter. And what I do is that I instill Ziloca in gel. It's one to 10 with a uh, saline solution. Um, because this is really, really painful. And I want my, my cat to not to feel anything. I want the esophagus to be numb. So I put Ziloca in throughout the, um, you see, throughout the length of the um, ruptured, of the dilated stricture, and then throughout the length of the esophagus. Okay, this cat came three days later with this huge esophagitis that we have caused, we have caused it. Okay, let's see how the esophagus has healed. And has the stricture been reformed? Yes, the stricture has been reformed and we had to dilate it again, but not, you know, in the initial form. This was easier this time. We have caused all this rupture now with a bigger balloon. Now, this time we got in with a bigger balloon. And you can see the rupture that we caused. It's very, very, you know, uh, when you see it, you say, oh, my God, I have ruined the whole esophagus. But the esophagus is healing so good uh, in two or three days time. And now what I'm doing this is why you see this blurred picture is that I'm taking my scope in and out, in and out in order to keep the uh, length of the uh, of the hole that we have caused. So we have caused that, okay? We have, but this is going to heal. We don't care. This is going to heal. You can see the damage. If you don't cause that, then you will never open the stricture. This is the kind of tearing that we need. Without x-ray, Diane, please explain on that. Yes, we do the balloon dilation without an x-ray, with endoscopy. We do it with endoscopy. We don't need an x-ray. If you mean barium uh, study, yes, you can do that, but then you will need a lot of days. You will always do your barium after your endoscopy, not before your endoscopy. Okay. So three days later, we did the second dilation. Let's see what happened with this poor cat. And then seven days later, third dilation. You see that the esophagus is much, much better. Pink, pinker. 
And let's go and see now. You see how this is only four days later and it has healed. You see how well it has healed this huge, huge rupture that we've caused. It has healed and it starts forming again a fiber stitch, a fiber tissue here. My God, you see, it has healed and it starts in four days time. So if you live 10 days, then you will see your initial length. So this was the third session. And let's see our result in our third session. It's very, very, you know, it needs patient and it needs for people to actually pay for these procedures, for the owners to pay these procedures. These can take up to, you know, 14 sessions. And this is not something cheap. These are expensive procedures. So now we have ruptured again. I'm not showing the, the balloon dilation because it's the same thing, the exact same thing. And the result is that we have caused from this diameter, we went up to all this tearing up of the esophagus as well. Again and again and again, every three or four days. You might need seven, eight, and we get into the clinically now, this cat was much, much, much better, much better. She could swallow uh, canned food without even putting it in the blender. Um, but we had to do the procedure, even though this cat was not re regurgitating, re regurgitating. Hello from Romania. What kind of food? That's a good one. I uh, tend to, in these patients, with severe esophagitis, we tend to give something, you know, that, that it can easily be melted. AD would be, you know, one option. Um, or ID, but uh, blended with um, gastrointestinal, not only ID, maybe, um, you know, uh, the Royal Canine uh, clinical diets as well. I don't mind any clinical diet that can be used uh, with worm butter as a start canned food as a second stage, and then uh, dry food. Now, in terms of uh, esophagitis, uh, do you use cortisone after each, not after each dilation, but yes, at this side of the, uh, at the side of the, uh, of the stricture, we could instill with the needle that I have shown you earlier, we could instill cortisone peripherally. Okay, and we give actually, we also give uh, cortisone after, even if we have such a severe uh, esophagitis. Now, the treatment for esophagitis, first we give uh, uh, a PPI inhibitor like lansoprazole or omeprazole, and then on an empty stomach always, then we give sulcrophate, of course sulcrophate. Sulcrophate is the A and the Z of esophagitis. So first, the, the correct order is PPI inhibitor, pantoprazole, lazoprazole, esomeprazole, whatever you want. Then half an hour later, we give uh, sulfurethate in a syrup form, not in a tub form. In a tub form, it doesn't work. Okay. And then we give an antibiotic for some days because we, we have caused a severe inflammation in the area due to the balloon dilation. Um, pro most of the times we do it uh, like in a clav amoxicillin and a clav a clavulanic acid. It would be better if you did injections, but with cats and injections, this is a bit, you know, I try to avoid a lot of injections due to the uh, fish, to the feline injectional sites of comas. So the less injections they have, the better it is because it's not only in vaccinations, okay? It has been proven that even cortisone injections or antibiotic injections can cause local sarcomas in cats. Um, so this is pretty much, and also we give uh, prednisolone in very low dosages, like 0 0.3 milligrams per kilo, or um, anti-inflammatory dose, like 0 0.5 milligrams per kilo. And we always, always re-inspect uh, the patient in three to four days time. We always do that every three to four days. Okay. Um, Yes, 
with the gastro protection, we gave uh, yes, we gave, we gave uh, cortisone as well. And let's see. A case with a dog now of a stricture. And this dog suffered from an open lower esophageal sphincter, which actually, this is the stricture here, as you see, the, the, the esophagus was hugely broad, just behind proximal to the stricture. And as you've seen, there was a, a ring formed as well. And this is the stomach here, and this is fluid, gastric fluid from the stomach. Okay, this is really, really bad. And let's see what we did in this case. So we go into, this is all fluid coming from the stomach, gastric fluids. You see how it retrogrades from the stomach into the esophagus. This is why this was actually formed. This is a very, very nasty case. And you see that the lower esophageal sphincter, you cannot tell the borders between the esophagus and the stomach. It's all open. It's like uh, uh, the same lumen. The esophagus just goes into the stomach without a sphincter. And this was the dilation procedure. This shown better than in the cat. So we dilate the balloon. And we wait there, dilated, 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 and dilated. We just stay. You see for how many minutes? And I try gradually to over in distend the balloon. And then the next time I use bigger balloons and bigger balloons in diameter so that we can keep uh, a very safe for the animal diameter in order to be functional, in order to be able to eat. Okay. And then let's see what we have caused. Sorry. Can you hear me now? I think that my connection is a bit... Let's see what I can do. Okay. And can you hear me? Because I cannot start. Oh, thank you. I will solve it. Just give me a second. Now we'll solve it. I will share screen again. I'm sorry, I will stop sharing for a while so that I can reshare.
Give me just one second because my PowerPoint is not responding for some reason. Okay. One second and I'm back. Okay. Share screen again. Okay, good now. And this is the kind of tearing that we caused with our balloon. Okay, this is huge here. You can see, can everybody see me now and see my videos? Please answer to the chat. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for confirming. Okay, so you can see how huge of a tearing that was. And we go back and forth with the scope. This is really, really scary. If you see it in a picture, you can see how much of a tearing this is, how big of a tearing this is. Okay, now we're back. And you can see that the rest of the lumen has a very normal mucosa as well. So, so for your foreign bodies, we're going to have a separate webinar for the foreign bodies, but I always want you to check your cats. When a cat is coming drooling into your practice, you might see that they have under the tongue and you have to sedate the cat in order to see that um, strings. This is a very, very common uh, foreign body for cats. For cats, esophageal foreign bodies are less often than gastric foreign bodies. Uh, rather than strings and needles and some fish hooks. And the common location for all foreign, foreign bodies are the thoracic inlet, the heart base, and the esophageal hiatus where the esophagus, uh, where the esophagus is narrowing uh, normally due to um, its anatomy, okay? And you always have to, uh, to be aware of the hairballs because they can be very, very nasty for a bodies embedded in the esophagus. In dogs, there is a predisposition, a predisposition in terrier breeds, of course, uh, most commonly bones, toys, you know, hoops and toothpicks. The hoops are, you know, a bit difficult. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you a lot of cases and a lot of tricks and tips how to remove uh, hoops in the webinar that will follow in the next months. And um, this is a bone here. Bones, if you cannot retrieve them, advance them in the stomach. First of all, it's easier to do a gastrotomy than do a esophagotomy. And secondly, you will never need to do a gastrotomy because the bones can be digested. We have done it so many times and we have actually followed these cases. None of these dogs had to undergo a gastrectomy or a gastrotomy. So we always assess the esophagitis after we remove the bone. And you can see here, this is the bone in the stomach, okay? And we don't care about the bone. You see that there is a severe esophagitis and we have to take care of that in order not to form a stricture. And we inform the owners uh, every time, each and every time we tell them that if you see the dog regurgitating, you bring it right away because a stricture might be formed. And of course we give all the esophagitis treatment that, that I have told you about, okay. And this is an overtube for very, very sharp objects. I'm using the overtube. The overtube is this tube here. And then you put your endoscope through the tube and you can advance the bone in the overtube so that you can put it safely in the overtube and bring it with your scope and with the overtube outside. You see how with rotatory movements, I'm bringing the bone in the overtube in order to 
grab it out. Okay. And sometimes, this is another point that I want you to take as a take-home message, sometimes we have some foreign bodies in the esophagus that shouldn't be there. For example, a piece of fish, which is very soft. Why should a piece of fish or of meat be in the esophagus just lying there, staying there? This is actually a, uh, a fruit piece, but you see that the esophagus is not, it's not embedded in the esophagus. It's staying right there without even um, proceeding into the stomach. And let's have a look at this one. This is actually soft food there. So you will be a hero when you just shove this uh, foreign body in the stomach because it's food and it's going to be digested. But don't leave this patient go home without um, a proper diagnostic procedure. This is, you know, very soft. I thought when I saw that, I said, what is it? Is it a bone? Is it something hard? So we put in our forceps, as you will see, and it was very, very soft. It was dry food and it was just there, lying in the esophagus with no, for no reason. Check these dogs for underlying hypomotility disorders. Don't send these patients home because they will come back with another foreign body that would be, that would be more dangerous. Um, you, they should be checked for Addison's disease. Actually, this dog was a Boston Terrier with an Addison disease and it had this very, very small, uh, it was either um, a piece of fish, something, or a piece of pear um, in the esophagus. Uh, check them for a hypothyroidism. And also there is a disease called the immature esophagus of Westy, uh, West Highland White Terriers that up to one year old, they're regurgitating and then uh, because of the immaturity of their esophagus. And sometimes in, you know, you just take an x-ray and these dogs have mega esophagus with no reason and they don't even regurgitate sometimes. They don't even, the owners haven't even noticed that. So um, please beware of these patients when you see something like an abnormal uh, foreign body. So you see that we preceded the forceps and that it's very, very soft. It shouldn't be there. It shouldn't have stayed there in the esophagus. Okay. And what about my esophagus? I've told you that this is not the way to diagnose uh, endoscopy is not the right way to diagnose uh, mega esophagus. Uh, so just for educational purposes, you see the fluid. This is a mega esophagus in the dog. Um, you see the fluid in the esophageal uh, area, just standing there without proceeding. These patients uh, could have a very, very hard recovery. Okay. Uh, Fin mucosa, the submucosal vessels, uh, in the dilated esophagus could sometimes be visible. We could have or not have esophagitis. Okay. And let's see that one. This is just dry food in the esophagus with a very flaccid uh, esophagus. And check this out. Even the pellet, this pellet is shown here in the, black, in the blue arrow. This is amazing, the photograph. Okay, but this is not the correct way of uh, diagnosing uh, mega esophagus. A plain radiograph, lateral uh, radiograph, could easily diagnose it, and then you have to find the underlying uh, reasons for the mega esophagus. This is a very good one. You might encounter sometimes these nodules in the esophageal area. These are lymphoid nodules most of the times and they are suggestive of uh, food allergy. I tried to take biopsies from this, from this animal. It wasn't possible from other animals. Um, it has been proven that it was um, uh, food allergy as a component in these nodules. This is not spiroterica nodules, okay? Spiroterica nodules are totally different. And here, as we finish 
the scoping and I'm trying desperately, you see the nodules all over the esophagus here as well. Okay. And let me see if I can see the point of strangulation because there is a point where the esophagus is a bit here. You see that there is a point here that the esophagus is extra luminarly uh, stricter from the outside. So we did a CT scan and this animal had, um, was the esophagus was compressed by the cervical muscle, which was very, very thickened uh, and inflamed at the level of A5. And actually this dog had undergone, it could not swallow. It was regurgitating all the time, just because of this uh, strang uh, strangulation, just because of this extra luminal compression. Um, and this had undergone myotomy, which was very helpful. And this is a very, very uh, amazing case. You will see uh, gastroesophageal intersection. So I'm scoping this animal. Oh, sorry. And we're finishing just these two last cases. So I'm scoping the animal and I see this mass into the, in the lumen of the esophagus. And I say, what kind of a mass is that? We should biopsy this mass. Is it an esophageal mass? You see that the... Um, the walls of the esophagus are really, really thin. You can see through them. Okay, a lot of fluid, gastro, uh, esophageal reflux disease. Okay, let's go, let's proceed with the endoscopy. And you will see something really, really fascinating happening. A lot of foam. So we say, okay, let's go, let's just clear the picture a bit. Let's put some water and make the, the picture. And I'm starting to having an idea of what this might be because of the ruga that I'm seeing. So all of this is a stomach into the esophageal uh, lumen. So I go into the stomach now. And you see that the minute I inflate the stomach, all the stomach is coming out of the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, this was a dog that was regurgitating for a, lot, for, for a long time, and it had herniation, hiatal hernia. And the minute the hernia was uh, corrected, then it, it, was, it didn't regurgitate anymore. So the predisposing factor are mega esophagus, esophageal dysmotility disorders, and laxity of the esophageal hiatus. And the last one is what this animal had. And once it was corrected, this dog has been regurgitating for three years. For three years, I cannot accept a patient undiagnosed. And our last case is about esophageal neoplasia. Of course, in senior dogs, we can have sarcoma, fibrous sarcoma, osteosarcoma, sarcoma, scrum cell carcinoma. In these patients, for example, in this cat, one of um, my colleagues asked me later about PEG tube. Yes, in this cat, you can do two things. You can either put a stent, an esophageal stent, as a relief in order to keep the lumen open, or, and we biopsied this and it was um, uh, sarcoma, uh, and uh, no, actually, this was uh, squamous cell carcinoma in the cat. And um, you can either put a relief stent, but it's only going to be for a few, you know, for a while up until the proliferative tissue uh, goes through the stent as well. Or you can put a pet tube as well in order to preserve the uh, body condition score of the animal. This was a very, very nasty case. Otherwise, you don't have any other choices in these patients. You will euthanize them. That's pretty much everything. Thank you very much. That was my favorite slide from Alha. Whether it's a dog or a lion, whatever it is, we cure it. Um, I think that the vet profession, the veterinary profession, is one of the most amazing professions in the world. And the way we interact with each other, um, 
I think that we have an amazing, amazing uh, equipa- uh, occupation and interaction with each other. The, the, the human doctors are not like that, believe me. Let's see a bit of, of, Jason, you can take over if you like. I'm so sorry for the technical problem that I had with one of my videos. Well, that's okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vasiliki. Uh, thank you for your brilliant pre- presentation. And if you have further questions, please contact us uh, on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. Uh, okay, today's webinar is over. Thank you. Hope you enjoy today's webinar. Thank you, everyone, very, very much. I can't see any questions that I haven't answered. Um, Greetings to all the countries, to Bulgaria, to Switzerland, to Cyprus, to Greece, to everyone. And I hope to meet you soon in person. Uh, Most of you to Saudi Arabia. I'm sorry, I'm biased, so positively biased towards Saudi Arabia. I love the country. Uh, I have visited it uh, a lot of times. All of you, all of you, and I'm always, always available for any questions that you might have, any cases that you might have and you want to ask me, always available. Thank you.